Welcome to the Case Autopsy, the verdict and settlement podcast. Case Autopsy is part of the family of podcasts brought to you by Lawyer Minds. In this podcast, we explore recent verdicts and settlements from around the country to try and distill down the best techniques for you to apply in your cases. Here's your hosts, Mike Campbell and Chris Finney. Chris, how's it going, man? What's up, Mike? How you doing? Hang Good, buddy. Now. Yeah. Hey, so uh, you've been on a couple of these now. We're just going to make it official. You're, you're the co- your co-host. Looking forward to this. Going to be. I mean, it's a selfish deal for me. I'm glad you asked me to to hop on with you the, the previous times, and now make it more of a permanent deal. But I get to learn a lot of stuff, and I think this especially uh, is a learning one when we're talking to Barry. I mean, this is going to be pretty impressive. I know. And I, you know, we talk about not doing trials in teams and or doing trials in teams. And I think we got to do stuff like this in teams because there's so much stuff that I'm going to miss. And there's just the way, yeah. you know, we, the way we all approach things is differently. So yeah. I'm glad that Look, you're this is looking forward to talking to him and kind of sharing the load on this one. Great, man. Let's jump into it. Yep. You're listening to the case autopsy, the verdict and settlement podcast. Here's your hosts, Mike Campbell and Chris Finney. Barry, how's it going, brother? Great, Mike. It's going great, Chris. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about your practice? So um, I've been practicing like 38 years, which freaks me out, uh, in the Midwest, uh, Northwest Indiana. It's uh, the first exit in Indiana from Chicago. So it's really part of the Chicagoland area. And uh, small practice, found my niche in medical malpractice when I was uh, a young lawyer. I had a client uh, come in who told them, still, it's the worst story I've ever heard. And it got me uh, hooked on the practice in a very bad way. Uh, this little girl, Kara, had a rheumatoid arthritis deformity. And so she had to go to the inner jaw. So she had to go to the surgeon to get it repaired. And they figured there'd be a lot of swelling. So they put her in a prophylactic tracheostomy. And you're supposed to put it in at the ninth or 10th ring, you know, down by the, down the neck because there's an artery that runs up here. But of course the guy puts it up here, the third ring. And so Kara is uh, in the hospital room with her mom and dad on the fourth or fifth possible day. And mom's on the bed and the sister and dad are in the room and their artery bursts. And she, she bleeds out within a minute in front of her family. You can imagine what that looked like. And in Indiana, the death of a child is worth about ten dollars or $15,000 because there's no loss of love and affection at that point. So we tried to get emotional distress because, I mean, they witnessed this horrible, horrible event. Nothing worse, right? And the Supreme Court said there's no touching. There's no contact in the old emotional distress uh, contact rule. And we argue, well, you mean other than the blood? And uh, they said no. And so at that point, it's like, come on. It was Indiana in the 70s. Tort reform was coming on. And we decided to, you know, to go there because we liked the challenge. I liked the medicine. And I've been doing that ever since. That's awesome. And you've got some great partners there at your office working with you who have the same passion and commitment. That's hugely important, right? You can't be a solo practitioner. You guys know that. Right. Uh, Holly Wojcik. Is yep. uh, we try all our cases together, and um, it's been it's been fun. We have nice divisional labor. You know, she'll take she'll do the uh, directs of the witnesses, and I'll do the liability and the crosses, and we split opening and voir dire, and we've had a good time. It's uh, collaboration's huge. I can't Chris, imagine practicing by myself. Right, and Chris and I have talked about that. I mean, I had a solo practice for a while. Chris has a solo practice now, but we collaborate on cases and. Um, Tell us a little bit about why it's important to, how it's helped you with cases to collaborate and work with someone. So, you know, you guys have probably come in after the case has been started and you co-counsel, somebody calls you to try the case with you and you're reading the depositions and you're talking and you're preparing and you realize that the person that brought you in is in love with the case. <laughs> they don't see, it's a perfect case. They love their clients, which is great. And they love their liability experts and they love everything about the case. And they're going to you know, get a gazillion dollars on the case and they want you to come help and try it and you know, spread the risk. And then you realize uh, there's something called contrib 
a comparative fault, and there's something called assumption of risk, and something called mitigation of damages, and it's all over these records. Not that you can't figure it out. So it seems to me that when you fall, you have a tendency to fall in love with the case when there's nobody there to criticize you or to, or to point out the bad stuff and to begin to work on that as much as the good stuff. Because we all know it's the bad stuff, you know. The bad stuff doesn't have to be as bad as the good stuff is good to lose the case. I mean, it just takes something for the jurors to hang their head on. And it's okay if it's identified, as we know. You know, you can focus it and find out what the answer is and sort of do the judo thing and flip it to your advantage and own it and embrace it. But I just see a lot of solo practitioners falling in love with the case and not exploring the bad stuff or also not spending the money. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's, that's a big thing, I think, Gary or Barry, that we have been talking about. I was talking to some other guys here is that somebody will get a case and the worst thing you can hear is, oh, I think it's going to cost me five or 7,000 to get this to trial. And, and it's like, well, I mean, maybe, or it could cost you 50. Like, you're not really sure, depending on where the case takes you. And, and Mike and I have talked about this, is that when you bring co-counsels in early, you then spread the cost. And then when you're spreading the cost, all of a sudden things seem to be more achievable and the case gets better. Have you found in your practice that whenever you've done what's, what's right for either the client or the case, it's improved the value or, or the case, like, to, to presentation, or, or how would you look at that? So it, it, assessing whether you want to take the case or not initially, you know, you project forward to trial, and you know what you need to, to be the best and most prepared in the courtroom. And it's about technology these days, I find. And it's also about your expert witnesses. And I budget $100,000 minimum for a medical malpractice trial. And that's all I've been doing. So I don't have my, my filter is really through the view of a lens of a med mal case. But then obviously, you go in with a hundred. Like we're going to spend a hundred if we're taking this case. That's the minimum. Minimum. Yeah. And you're going to carry it for four or five years. Yeah. Right. Um, and you got to probably got a co-counsel fee along the way, who's not willing to put in any money. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. Um, and then focus groups. So you're going to get $50,000, $70,000 in the case, you know, before the pretrial conference. But my, my, I realized that, you know, don't take the case unless you're willing to do that. And in my world, nobody settles a case early. I mean, it's happened, yeah. you know, a few times, obviously, but you can't assume that. Well, let me ask you, so would you, because in Indiana, it's a little bit different, and you touched on it a little bit earlier, I think, uh, you have medical review boards. So uh, when you're are you taking the case before a medical review board before you can go forward to file it in a circuit court and, and basically you're getting it all prepped up procedurally for the, for the medical review board or how does that work? Kind of tell us how that process works out. So in 75, Dr. Otis Bowen was a governor of Indiana and he decided to pass something called the Indiana Medical Malpractice Act, which is a huge departure from common law. So you can just tick through the bad stuff. There's caps, but not just on non-economic, caps on all damages. Literally everything you put on the board will be capped out at, you know, in those days, half a million dollars. It's now up to 1.8, but so you, so you cap, you cap on all damages. The attorney's fees are capped depending on how much you get because there's a sliding scale. And you've got to spend about two years in a medical review panel consisting of three doctors or healthcare providers that'll review the case to figure out whether you've got a case or not. Um, to how date, I think nine, get, how does the panel get selected? So it's not like I'm, I'm dealing with, and I'm dealing with the same attorneys all the time. So yeah. we have a process, we work together. But assuming you can get together, uh, you agree on a panel chairman, a lawyer who acts as you know, the herd the cats at the panel. He's got to get the parties in line, he's got to get the doctors in line, and okay, you got a chairman, now he'll say, Okay, so you submit a name to the panel. And it's a doctor you don't know. And it's got to be somebody you don't know because you don't want to cross get cross-examined on the fact that you talked about the case beforehand. So it's got to be a fresh face, no affiliation. So you pick one, the defendants pick one, and those two pick a third. Okay. And then it's sort of wow. maybe an issue about specialty, if you have a multi-specialty uh, defense panel. Who compensates them? So the winner pays. So you pay about 2000 bucks plus the panel chair gets... Uh, the winner. The winner pays? Winner pays. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. 
the whole the whole thing is that they figure if you lose the panel, that'll promote settlement. That is the defendant, and if the defendant wins in the panel, then theoretically you're not going to go forward. But it doesn't it doesn't uh, if you lose at the panel as a plaintiff, you don't you can still pursue your case in circuit court. State exactly. Court, court. Okay. But you're, but you're stuck with these three panel doctors or nurses or chiropractors, whatever, as experts at trial. Oh, oh wow! Okay. So right? they'll be experts at trial. Right. You got to pay them just like an expert, or they've got to pay them just like an expert. Wow. Does that, okay. If you were if you were successful as a plaintiff, does that serve as basically what we have to do is file an affidavit of merit? So basically, they're saying this. So as if you prevail as plaintiff, does that serve as that same mechanism? I think so. It's so we so you file a proposed complaint in front of the Indian Department of Insurance that triggers the action, tolls the statute, and then you go forward. You pick your panel. You do your little this limited discovery because you don't want to waste a lot of time doing depths and all that. And then you make written submissions of the panel, arguing your case, attaching the records, and that's the evidence. And the other side does that. Okay. And the panel chairman gets them together. They have a Zoom meeting these days, or they rarely meet in person, and they render an opinion, three separate opinions, about whether it's malpractice, and if so, whether it's a factor. So let's say you lose, but you like your case. Sometimes you lose, you say, oh, you know what? That's a pretty good panel opinion. I don't think I'm going forward. And if, in effect, you get a, a free review. Sure. But if you know you've got a good case, then that's when the case really begins because you've now got to flip the panel yeah. or eat away at the credibility. Yeah, you've got, and, and, it's, and one of them is one you picked. Right, but that's why you're careful to pick somebody like at random. And we usually have the panel chair pick it for that purpose, so we're not affiliated with them. That's exactly right. So you I mean, really it's not as fun. It's not as fun like when, you know, their expert tells them for the first time that or, or your expert <laughs> You know, it's testified for the other side as well. You know, they're yeah. having a first time in trial. That's always fun. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of strategy involved in just yeah. getting the case going, right? Time I mean, and strategy. This yeah. takes a long time. This is right. not happening. Wow. It's interesting. It's two years. It's two, two additional years. Oh, man. So back to the economics, right? So wow. now you've got 10000 in the case because you have to have a review. You, want to sound, you don't want to sound like an idiot when you make your submission to the panel. So you get somebody to review it. You've got soft costs. You've got like the paralegal staff. You've got medical records expenses. You've got um, you've got to make the submission. You've got to maybe depose somebody along the way, do some discovery. And then if you lose, you don't have to pay. But if you win, you got to pay. So whatever money you've got, it, it delays the process two years at least. So Barry, when you were starting out at, as a young lawyer, new lawyer, were you um, working with a firm? I mean, how? How did you go from um, not doing medical malpractice cases to having to put everything on the line for one or two case cases? Well, um, so when I was when I did my first case that I told you about um, with Kara, I was with a solo practitioner, and then my law school buddy Perry Theodorus, um, my law firm is Theodorus and Ruth. We got together when I was six years out. And that was 1988. So we've been together ever since. And uh, we realized that, you know, MedMal, medical malpractice in Indiana is not like Cook County, Illinois, across the border because of the caps. So you have to be really extra careful, not like anybody, when you take the case. But we realized that there is a way, because there's not a lot of competition in this area when we first started out, because nobody wanted to put the money out. And and a horrible cap. So right. it's like, okay, there's a vacuum here. We can work with this, right? There's a vacuum in this horrible market. We can do something yeah. here. It's like, right. Think about your fee cost ratio. Oh, yeah. sure. You're trying a case where the most you can get is half a million dollars. Yeah. And that's what I was going to ask you. Like, you know, we shoot seven or 10 to one sometimes. I mean, that's got to be almost, it's very difficult for you to get there. You have to hit a home run, I guess, to get that. Well, you got to, you got to get the cap. You got to make sure everything's yeah. the cap. Yep. And so, uh, we, uh, we, we're now at 1.8. So we can get, you know, half, 560,000, 560,000 in fees and 100,000 in costs, hopefully, assuming there's one defendant it's for the straightforward case. And then sometimes you get a doctor who does more than one thing wrong during the course of the care and treatment. So that would give you, does that double it? Ah, okay. okay. We had a case. We had a case a long time ago when that was started to become prominent issue. The baby was born 
and prenatally suffered from anoxic encephalopathy because the, they didn't do a proper uh, timely delivery. Which is brain damage. Afterwards, brain damage. prenatal injury, correct. Or it, certainly uh, intrapartum injury. But postnatally, they did not monitor the blood sugar. And so the baby now had a uh, encephalopathy from lack of glucose in two mm. separate and discrete parts of the brain. So we had an expert say, listen, you've got the prenatal injury, which causes this problem. The postnatal injury causes this problem. And you've got two separate acts of malpractice, so you've got double recovery. I mean, this is a mess. If you ask me, like, how do you parse out the two separate acts and all that stuff? And, you know, it seems like, and I think maybe we'll talk about that in some of these cases, some of these bigger cases that have garnered national attention that you've handled. But um, that can seem to be to get in a really a mess that leaves a lot of discretion to a judge or whoever's looking at it to make those decisions. We've got a case. We've got a case where a woman, it was a cluster. It was, it was an awful, just a series of problems, but basically the child wasn't delivered timely. So they had the anoxia and they screwed up the delivery. So now the child's got an herbis palsy. And because they delayed the delivery, the mom has got a horrible tear, a, a horrible a stage four tear. And so now you've got three separate injuries and there's, there's no case on point. So now it's sort of you know, meandering around there and trying to get somebody to pay twice. And, and but the, the um, permutations are endless. And so we're constantly dealing with that issue. And, so, you know, the law, it, we don't have like, the cases in Illinois are falling off the shelves, but not so much in Indiana. It's started to right. catch up. Do you take cases in, in Chicago, obviously? I guess you practice in Cook County if they come in or what? Yeah. My brother's licensed there, Rob Ruth. So uh, we've tried cases together there. And we've, got, we've, I've, I've tried a few cases there. And, so, uh, the, the, you know, it's, it's, it's different. We yeah. talked about you starting your practice. What advice would you have for someone who decides, I want to do med mal and they're, they're, wanting to transition to a med malpractice? So they need a line of credit, a healthy line of credit. Sure. Um, they need a mentor because think about the disparity between the skill sets. Yep. And we, we, and I'm sure you guys see this too, people who dabble, right? It's like me dabbling in an SEC action or a, uh, uh, or a, uh, I don't know, a divorce. I mean, you only know what you do. So, Think about not only, but it's not common law. Now you got to know every nuance of the statute. But you're up against people who do this every day. Right. And it, it's, it's fraught with problems. Um, having said that, if you, if you like the medicine, you've got the curiosity, uh, which is much easier these days, then just make sure you spend the money. You, don't, you, can't, you can't shortcut it. You can't do it on, on the cheap, so to speak. And you I remember... Uh, we had a trial a little while ago before technology was coming to the courtroom and they would supply their own screens. We had a doctor who was really digging in on the defense. And we brought an 80 inch screen to the courtroom right behind the witness. It was magnificent. It was beautiful. And he had a 55 inch TV. And I heard him yelling at his attorney about why we had a bigger TV than him. <laughs> yeah. Right on, man. Right yeah, on. exactly. So yeah, you got to go all in. You also need a jury consultant. You know, these, these you do that. Are, we, we, you and I have talked about that before. You, you utilize jury consultants uh, on, a, on a regular basis or, or when the case warrants it. When do you make that call? Uh, when we know it's going to trial. I think we, we've, Holly and I have learned enough to know, you know, how to screen cases and, you know, intuitively understand the issues. But again, we can still fall in love with our case. And so we like having the jury consultant help us with the uh, focus groups. Sure. We can do them ourselves, but I think you get a little more detached when you don't do them. And uh, at that point, then we're in the trenches with the jury consultant. And so do you have the consultant run the focus groups for you and develop a report for you? Or you run them and they just analyze what's going on? No, we hand it over. Okay. Gotcha. We hand it over. So another we do focus groups right. ourselves. You know, uh, we do the light focus groups. There's a little screening focus groups. But it comes down to practicing more there and doing your openings and, yeah. and really crunching the issues. We like to have a third party there just to keep us in line, make sure we don't fall in love with our case or, or overly – Pessimistic. And by the time you get to the third focus group, you probably nailed it. You probably found this, found the bad stuff, the warts, you solved the problem, and now everything is fine. And you, you chop your case in half, you start the timeline, you know, six months later. We had a case where it involved a, um, 
lady who had pulmonary hypertension and she died on the anesthesia table during a C-section. And we, didn't, we thought that the anesthesiologist ignored the notion of the pulmonary hypertension being on the problem list, which you've got to deal with differently during the surgery. But that brought in all sorts of stuff about whether the patient was giving proper histories, et cetera. Mm. So we narrowed it down to the eight minutes from the time she was wheeled in until the time she coded. So our case went from literally like three years to eight minutes. And I think we think we solved the problem. We ultimately settled it, but we had much different results from the focus groups once we realized that the issue is, you know, much more, much more narrow and discreet. It costs a lot of money to get that that information too. When you hand that over to a jury consultant, you're another investment, another cost you're going to carry. Um, About forty thousand dollars for that. Significant cost. Yeah, gotcha. So you. Have I wouldn't a, go to trial without it. Yeah, wouldn't, sure. Wouldn't go to trial without it's, it. It's worth the investment. Um, and it sounds like you basically have a, now a system in place for every med mal case that comes into the office. This is this is sort of the overview of the 10,000 foot view of the stages that this case is going to go through our office. Yes. Especially with respect to the panel process. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's on autopilot. It's not like a, you know, the attorneys do closings all day and have the paralegals prepare the deeds. It's not like that. There is a two attorney supervision, but it's, you learn about your case. I mean, we've, I just dropped a case yesterday uh, in the middle before I made my panel submission and realized there wasn't a case. Sure. And it does give you the luxury of time of, of the, not having to thoroughly research every case as it comes in the office before you file, like getting the certificate of merit. We don't have to worry about that. Right. So it does give us a little leeway and breathing space to figure out whether it's a case you want to go to trial on or, or refile. But, um, and we're good about pushing things through the panel. Yeah. We're probably better than most. We win like 65% of our, 60 to 65% of our panels because of our screening. You, you, you know what flies and what doesn't and where the contribute issues are, which you're not going to survive. And, and uh, is a doctor likable? Is your patient, is your client not likable? Well, so another speak, lesson is you better be prepared to walk away from a case. Right. Speaking of likability, um, I think that's probably the two cases we want to talk to you about is whether these doctors were likable people. Right. Um, these are the ones that have national attention, New York Times, uh, Vanity Fair magazine, a lot of uh, publications surrounding some of these doctors, which you and I, well, me, you and Mike were talking about before, that had actually affected entire communities. Um, and I know one of them uh, was in the Vanity Fair one, and Mike has looked at that those articles, and, and kind of we wanted to delve into these uh, separately, but in this podcast, um, kind of get your thoughts behind, you know, kind of finding these cases where somebody's kind of, I don't want to say well, maybe butchered an entire community where there's more than just one person, that there's a, a, a habitual actor out there who's affecting the health and welfare and safety of community members. Rogue doctors. I, I call them the rogue doctors, rogue the outliers. Doctors. Yeah, that was it. Right. So. And, that's, and that's, that seems to be where you've taken your practice, and that's the, the Vanity Fair article. It's funny because you talk with um, you talk with any lawyer, they they'd say, "I'd love to have a case with national attention." You've now been in the New York Times and Vanity Fair, and um, for extremely positive, it, it terrible, terrible facts, but positive outcomes for the community. Trying to get these rogue doctors out, and then the one that the Vanity Fair article was uh, Dr. Mark Weinberger, and what I've read in the article. Is that he set up a sh he set up shop in the specific community where he was was because uh, it was union, so it had good health insurance, right. and then you had pollution, which right. would affect the sinus cavities, and so he was able to do and suggest all kinds of crazy procedures to get rid of these perceived uh, negative effects from the pollution on on the sinus cavities. Is that he was the nose doctor? The nose doctor. How did you, how did you come across this case? If you can talk about how you, how did you stumble into, and I don't mean stumble in, in a bad way, but how did you? Oh, no, I get you. Yeah, yeah. First of all, let me, let me start by saying that we all have these guys records in our practice, right? I mean, the odds of us not having one is less than us having a rogue doctor's records in our practice, a client subsequent treater, you know, a pain guy that's going crazy with pain injections, you know, the woman who had an unnecessary hysterectomy, uh, the, or, the guy whose orthopod operated on a benign lesion, a multi-level fusion. I mean, they're out there. Yeah. So you begin to have a nose for it. But we, we did stumble, Mike, on that one. 
Um, we had a lady who uh, had a, a sinus surgery and uh, she went to a subsequent treater who said uh, he didn't need the surgery. The CT was normal. Okay, we got one of those. And then we got a second one, which was interesting, but light hadn't gone off yet. And then I talked to the, I believe I talked to the ENT, the subsequent treater, who at least suggested that maybe there's something going on. So we put an ad in the paper, just a little guy. It said, have you had sinus surgery in Northwest Indiana? It may have been unnecessary. We got 350 calls. Are it was like, how long, you like a, huh? how long did you run the ad? couple of weeks and people just blew you up well I, I actually that's that's not right we got 15 cases from that that's what happened we got 15 gotcha. cases from that tons of calls sorry lots of calls though like people saw that and knew something was up well but but they hadn't blown up yet the 15 cases were interesting and, and the story started to begin to you know, have some kind of common themes and so we simply sent records requests to the 15 patients now, I remember this. We get the records back from the surgery center. You know, the surgery center. And I remember laying them on a table. You had the HMPs, you had the, uh, the endoscopic report, you had the operative report, and the post op. And they were essentially identical records. You would never know that was yours. It could have been one of 15 people. Like a copy and paste deal, you thought, or what? Totally template. Yeah, he, he was advanced. So he had an EMR. I think he had a medical. It wasn't written, handwritten. It was all electronically uh, documented. You go, wow. And then the, then the light bulb went off. And then there was a report in the paper that Dr. Weinberger is gone. Missing, right? Gone. Missing. The people showed, the staff showed up one morning, one Monday morning, one Monday morning and you can picture like the papers like swing, <laughs> floating to the floor, right? The safe is open, literally. And he is gone. He's gone. So now the newspaper gets a hold of that and calls us. And then we give an interview, start interviewing the clients. And then that's when the, that's when the horde came in, about 350 cases. And my, my partner goes, I said, should we take all these? I mean, we've got 50 cases right now. He's like, why wouldn't we right. just take them all? And the Paris crew, we took them all. And that's when it began to blow up. And he left in a way that really dominated the papers because he had it all planned out. He had been, we know from these de subsequent depositions of the receiver, for example, that he was sending survival equipment to France. How do we know that? Because the receiver called back a FedEx package he had sent to France and laid it out on his conference table. And he found things like an underwater scuba safe. I didn't know anything existed like that. He found how to survive. I mean, literally found books about books, that. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I mean, Barry, he I'm left not his wife. He like ran, like he right. just every left literally his family behind, right? He just. The, the, yeah, the staff, the staff had talked about the fact that these guys showed up in limos. We took the deposition, so we know this. And he exchanged diamonds for cash with these oh guys. These were diamond, these were diamond um, uh, <laughs> merchants. He, so he liquidated. Right. It was a business plan. He liquidated. He told his wife he was going to take her to Greece for her birthday. They rented a yacht. I mean, a captain, the whole schmear. And she wakes up one morning, and he's gone. I mean, he, he has disappeared. The captain didn't know where he went. He, she calls his cell phone. He answers it. Apparently, I was in Paris and clicked and hung up. And she'd never seen him again. So he, he cut out in the middle of the night in Greece? Oh, my. And, and he had a book, I think, too, besides not how to survive, but how to become invincible or so, something to that effect. So, so we learned all the backstory here, but, yeah. but the escape was incredible. I mean, it was insane. And because we had cases on file, you know, we got, we got the publicity or notoriety. Right. And we so took over the case. Him, you'd already had him served and everything like that. So there wasn't a, a problem getting him served on these cases. He was gone. He had 
all that had happened. So it was all, all these cases were in the panel, right? Uh, the medical okay, review right. panel process. Okay. We didn't have to, we didn't have to really file it in court yet because we just had to get through the panel. So what? So, uh, he sucked all the, all, uh, sucked all the equity out of his home, his practice. He had his own boat. He sucked the equity out of that and his wife co-signed for all these things. So she was left high and dry. She had, had a beautiful condo in, on Michigan Avenue in Chicago and she was evicted. I mean, he was heartless. So he, he cashed out and took off. So we had these cases and we were proceeding with him in absentia. He soon got indicted by the Northern District of Indiana for insurance fraud. Uh, and then of course, well, I should back up a second because Indiana's got one advantage about being in Indiana for these cases is they've got the patient's compensation fund. So the doctors have a layer of insurance. Say today it's, it's $500,000. The cap is 1.8. So the 1.3 million layer comes from this patient's compensation fund that the doctors pay surcharges into. Okay. But think about this, you've got limited policy. The 500, you may have 501.5 for a given policy period. So what happens when that runs out from all these cases? The patient's compensation fund comes in and stands in the shoes of the doctor mm. with literally unlimited funds. No kidding. So everybody's able to get their 1.8, essentially. Yeah. Oh, wow. Ah. But in Weinberger, because he left... You now have this deck action pending in federal court with the insurance company trying to get out of coverage because sure. he's not cooperating. Not mm -hmm. co that's right. Not cooperating. So that whole that whole deal lasted ten years before we got a settlement. Well, so who handled the deck action? Do you did you jump in or how does that work? Who's handling that? Yeah, we we intervened. Yeah. Um, insurance company against Weinberger. He had his own attorney, uh, but it was a delicate. Think about all the conflicts involved. Oh, in that. sure. Insurance guy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I heard the story is that. The adjuster on all these cases would never could never talk to anybody to anybody in the home office. He'd be happy lunch by himself. He did. He go to the water cooler. Nobody be there because <laughs> of oh, wow. the Chinese wall they had to build up between coverage and uh, and liability. Yeah, that is. I yeah. mean, that is just crazy. And then you. So, you know, this is important because it it is reflects what we all want to do. I think, which is protect the community. And so you guys decided we're going to take these cases. We don't, we don't know where it's going to go. Because it, it was all in treading waters at that point. Yeah. And you know, it, you know, like there's no guaranteed outcome in any of these cases, but this, this one specifically, it is just completely up in the air. What, what's going to, what's going to happen? That had to be a little scary. It was new for everybody. Sure. The fund had never been put in that position. Yeah. Oh, right. We didn't know what happens when his insurance runs out. I mean, you've got, we had 288 cases covering, you know, 10 years. So that doesn't allow a lot of multiple claims per policy period. So if the fund doesn't kick in, then we're high and dry. And we're not going to get anything from this guy. You know, he's, he's bankrupted his practice. He can get a judgment, you know, and throw in the garbage. So, so how did you carry these cases? You carried these cases 10 years? So we had a Kona Malad, great guys in Indianapolis. They do a lot of mass tort and class action. So we co-counseled with them. And it was, it was really fun. I mean, nobody died, thank God. They all went through unnecessary sinus surgery. But it wasn't like classic sinus surgery. It was scrape a little tissue here, send something to pathology, so they feel like you've had surgery. Wow. Oh. But his op report showed like eight different procedures. He didn't do any of them. He didn't do any of them. Because to get into the sinus, it's a little tricky. You've got this unsinate process. You've got to hook around there to get into the maxillary. It's time consuming. It's technically difficult. If he went in the sinus, he would drill a hole right, you know, right through, your, through your sinus, which caused the recirculation system because, problem. Because every time it drains the nose, it gets sucked back in your um, sinus. So it continuously... Uh, you have your chronic sinusitis, sinusitis. So you. So got, anyway, that's, so their expert. So we asked their expert if it was possible to do eight surgeries in fifteen minutes. Really good guy from Rush, I think. He goes, only with a hand grenade. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you hear everybody in the room just chuckling for like a half yeah. a half a minute. Right? <laughs> and he started chuckling. 
And I think like their, their expert even said something like, this is the worst doc drive. You know, he, I mean, they, he's the worst. So at trial, I've seen. I asked their expert, how did this go? The to guy trial? you're here for <laughs> is pond scum, correct? Objection. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but how did they get to trial? You just, I didn't even think these went to trial. Some of these went to trial. We tried eight of them. Oh, really? Lord. Wow. Tried wow. eight of them until we got called to the mediation table. Gotcha. Sure. The same them. expert in all eight for the defense? No, no, they, they went through a few. <laughs> <laughs> they ran out like, yeah. like, I can't do it anymore. It's just, please don't put me back up there. It's brutal. So it was, it was, I tell you what, the beautiful thing about that was you get to try cases. We don't try cases that much. That's right. Yeah. A year, twice a year? Yeah. We tried eight cases in two years between the two law firms, and we had so much fun. It was so fun to be in the courtroom that much. And rewarding. About the, like I said, the crosses yeah. were beautiful and fun. Right. And, yeah. and uh, the discovery was great. Talking to the receiver. So the defense attorney thought he'd be safe by saying, listen, so there was no money contained in this big, big box you sent to Paris, right? And he goes, actually, there was an Italian language book. And I opened it, and it was cut out, and there were 5,000 euros sitting inside the oh, book. Oh, holy cow. <laughs> you got to be – there's no safe questions, right? There's no safe questions. When That's you the, say receiver, tell us what you're talking about. Is this a bank sorry. receiver? So there, he had a lot of, because he sucked all the equity out, he had a ton of debt on his practice. Okay. And so I think correctly, the banks brought in a receiver to manage the liquidation and sale of the practice. I mean, he had a beautiful surgery center. It was decked out. Really? And so they put that up for sale. And they I don't think the charts were worth anything, but... There was good equipment there, so they had to liquidate it in orderly fashion to pay off the, uh, pay off the debtors. What the happened? Brothers. So what happened to this guy? What happened to this doctor? So we're at a Christmas party, our firm Christmas party. I was leaving for a depth the next day, so I went to O'Hare. We were in Chicago. I went to O'Hare, and I remember putting the key in my room and getting a text from Perry. You remember uh, when Michael Jordan retired and came back? Yeah. And he couldn't figure out, we saw the last dance, right? And so his message was simply, I'm back, right? Right. So Perry's text was, he's back. <laughs> and you knew. You knew. Yeah. But that, right. the thing about how, what does that do to the case, right? What is, how does that complicate the situation? Sure. Yeah. He got picked. So he was, I don't know what his business plan was exactly, but he was in a tent in the Italian Alps living with his transgender lover. Okay. And he accidentally gave her his last name, and she Googled him and saw that he was a fugitive from justice out of Indiana. She called a Carbonari, I think that's her name, Carbonari, and they brought him back in handcuffs with a U.S. Marshal to the Northern District of Indiana in Hammond. Wow. Nope. And so now, so now you got to try the case. Before, you get an instruction saying he ran away, so you get a presumption, you know, but his defense is, is not correct. Is, you know, is not be believed, but now he's available. So now we get to take his deposition. Oh man! So every time we we go to the Metropolitan Metropolitan Correctional Center in downtown Chicago, no place I want to be. And this guy who was like having sushi lunches brought in for his staff took a chauffeur, had this gorgeous condo on, on Delaware and in, in Chicago, Delaware Street in Chicago. I mean, took these magnificent trips, had his own boat. He comes in, you know, in the orange jumpsuit, you know, had to ask permission to go number two. I mean, they, he goes, I go to the bathroom. And the, the um, guard goes, one or two. It's like, two. Insane. Ah, geez. Wow. Oh, Jesus. Boy. So, so is he around? Is he in jail, I assume, now or what? So I just got a call from one of the news stations saying it's been, I guess it would be, uh, oh, I don't know. It was some anniversary or some period of time. They wanted to know where he was. And I don't know. I haven't seen him since uh, he got out a few years ago. He got out, like 2017 or so. He lives in Florida. Last oh, time wow. was his dad. Okay. I don't know where he is. So, Chris, you, you know, if you had one case like this and it became a Netflix documentary, which I'm assuming this will someday. Uh, American, pretty, Greed. American, American Greed. American Okay. You, you, I think you'd be pretty happy, right? But, oh. but, but then if you got two cases – I, I, yeah. I, I that that'd be kind of like well i guess the first one for barry wasn't good enough to get the new york times attention so he, they right. went back 
got you got another one. And this, um, <laughs> uh, this like the other it. one we're going to talk to you about. This involved. This is not uh, an ENT, but it's cardiology, right? This is and this has a little bit more. Um, there's a New York Times article on it from October 17th of 2015, and it's a case you guys recently resolved. Is that right? So, yeah, I'm, I'm careful because we have confidentiality. Yes. Yeah. So I can talk about the – I had some interesting trials, and there was uh, some publicity on these cases uh, through New York Times and some other sources. Um, but – and I can talk about what we learned in the trials yeah. that we did. So let, let's – let's talk. well, can you talk about the settlement value? Um, the settlement value is $66.5 million for 262 patients. So Weinberger's average was about 200,000 a patient. This was 250,000 a patient. Gotcha. And these were essentially, from what I can read, uh, unnecessary um, procedures for, for the heart, right? Stent implant, implants or what? So I think the Times article outlined the fact that it involved defibrillators, gotcha. pacemakers, angiograms, stents, Peripheral, peripheral atherectomies. And then, what is that, peripheral atherectomy? So if you've got um, blockage in your heart, there's a good chance you've got blockage in the arteries in your legs. And people have, as you age, you get cramps, it's hard to walk. And so That's you can take like a rotor ruler or balloon angioplasty to open up those vessels. There's some guy had 20-something surgeries done on his legs in, in, in one of these articles, I think. he was. That's correct. Was that right. one of your clients or no? Yeah, that, those are our clients. Gotcha. And so did you bring in the mass tort firm to help you guys with this as well on this one? So, uh, so uh, 2004, we finished up in 2014. It was the last final payments on that first one, the Weinberger case. And uh, I was skiing with the boys. My buddies would go every year. And I remember I'm getting off the lift and I get a call from David Cutshaw, you know, the co-counsel down in Kodomalad. He goes, let's get the band back together. <laughs> <laughs> so we, Run it back. we got a call from a local attorney about uh, the fact that he's, he had these two cases involving doctors who uh, put in unnecessary defibrillators. Now, defibrillators are as expensive as a medium-sized Mercedes. Wow. And the hospitalization is about the highest you can get besides an open, open heart in terms of reimbursements. So the reimbursements are really high for both the actual hard device and the, the soft cost of housing the patient. So an interesting trend, like what are the commonalities and what can you learn about these, these rogue practice uh, patterns is it seems to follow the um, technology. So before Weinberger learned how to do the surgery that he got nailed for, if you had a sinus problem, they would go in through – your gums basically cut a hole to, to reach your maxillaries. This is gruesome surgery and, you know, fraught with risk. But the ENT, who will turn out to be a whistleblower, remembers being at a seminar with Weinberger in LA, 2000, early 2000s. And all you do is you put a, not all you do, but you put an endoscope up the nose to access the sinuses. Well, that's a lot different. And he said, you could see the light bulb going on in Weinberger's mind thinking, oh, reimbursements are excellent, right? The indications are pretty clear, or are they, right? And uh, now you get great reimbursements because of new technology, it's much, much less invasive than open surgery. You can do it out of a surgery center. You know, as long as you have your own CAT scanner, you don't need any ancillary services. You don't need to be at a hospital. Mm -hmm. So it's, you may create a, a, like a one-man island for doing the medicine with no peaks to the outside other than a pathology report. Now, defibrillators used to be, you have the, um, the magnet or the generator up here, it used to be a big box you put it in your, uh, in your abdomen, right? It was horrible, right? But they miniaturized it and they put the leads into the heart. Much different, much less evasive procedure. So, Patients were more amenable to having that kind of surgery than they would have to carry around this big, you know, shock box on your stomach. But there was, a, there was something that happened in 2003, 2004. So the fibrillator 
is indicated for people who have poor ejection fracture, poor heart function. But there's also this thing where your ventricles can get out of sync if you've got a heart problem. So that's called cardiac resynchronization therapy. And they used to make that combined with a pacemaker, which made sure your heart didn't beat too slowly. And those are called CRTPs. This doctor got privileges to do this at the hospital, but not defibrillator privileges. I think this is spelled out in the articles. Yeah. And so you needed to have defibrillator privileges before you put in the CRTD, which is defibrillator, CRT with a defibrillator. The standard of care was, if you need a CRTP, you should make it a D, put the defibrillator lead in. But if you don't have privileges, you put it in more CRTPs in Munster, Indiana, than any other place in the country. <laughs> and then if you get defibrillator privileges, you give people the upgrade. Sure. Ah, so now you them? change it out, right? And get a whole new oh, reimbursement. Right. Oh, wow. And the thing about these is it's like the razor and a razor blade because you can buy the razor, the defibrillator, but then you have to keep going for these constant uploads where you check the data. And that gets to be read by the doctor. He gets to have the equipment set up for that and get a technical fee as well. So it's like an annuity for everybody that has a defibrillator. So he did the, the initial surgery with the CRTs or what a CRTPs or whatever you said. Right. Then he, then he got approved to put in the defibs or whatever. So he just called everybody else when they came back in for their appointments. He said, hey, guess what? We can make this a little better for you. You, know, you really need it. And so he just ran everybody right through again. In the meantime, he's got them in his monthly club, essentially, or whatever. How, and they're coming in to get their readings done. It's, yep. That's basically how he was running it. And, did, and I mean, yeah. No, I, well, well, there's also the stents and the angiograms and oh, yeah. the peripheral that he and others were doing. Let me ask you if you can comment on this. The manufacturers, they know where these products are going. They know, you know, wow, we're doing a lot of stuff in Munster, Indiana. It, was that something that the, that the reps, like did you, you talk to any reps, deposition testimony of them, or how did that factor in? The rep that sold these was in Fiji, moved to Fiji. <laughs> With Weinberger. <laughs> exactly. So that person of, literally just uh, went across the world. Oh, my goodness. So, so that's a great question because we had to consider the question of whether we sue right. Medtronic, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And I know Randy McGinn got a great verdict in New Mexico by suing the company who was paying kickbacks, the doctor, to use the device, right? Yeah. I think it was cardiology, too. It might have, I think It so. was the cardiologist. I think it was putting pacemakers. I got a 1000 bucks a piece of a pacemaker. And yep. she got a monster, like a $65 million verdict, including the punies. But now, having learned what we learned from Weinberger, the question is, why would we have to do that if we have unlimited insurance? Because the layer will pick it up. Right. Interesting. Yeah, it's a strategy. Okay. Wow. Let me ask you this, Barry. You you had said at the outset that um, we we all will probably encounter this. I mean, most of the people who would listen to this, and Chris and I both scour medical records all the time. Is there something that we, you know, we would look for or kind of have a spidey sense for in terms of trying to figure out if a doctor's doing or engaging in this type of behavior? So. You look at the specialties, and the ones that stick out to me in, in any of our PI practices, pain. We had a, a doctor who had a million dollars in charges for pain therapy on a client, so much so that we could not even make the claim for medical expenses because we couldn't say they were reasonable and necessary. Yeah, you can't in a situation like that at all. It's insane. So orthopedists operating a lot. I mean, you've got to check and make sure that the CAT scan correlates with the surgery or the MRI correlates with the surgery. But there are certain specialties and there are certain medical devices that sort of attract the rug practice people. But the best way to do it, this was revolutionized in 2012 when Medicare CMS started publishing their data. Mm. 
by utilization and reimbursements for every doctor in the country that got Medicare reimbursement. So this guy, uh, this cardiologist, we looked at that data. He was 19th out of 22,000 car- 22, cardiologists in the country in terms of Medicare reimbursement. You can't, in some, in some practices, you can't be like the top five or top 10 in terms of volume in a given specialty because there may not be enough hours in the day right. to do the procedures, right? So how, how does that work? 23,000 people. Right. So here's what you do. Here's a real simple screen. Go to the most recent Medicare data. Now it's two years old. Sure. And just sort by your city or your state or your county or zip code. And pick a couple interesting codes and sort them by the number of procedures. And there's a dashboard for this. Wall Street Journal has one. I think the New York Times may be down, but it's, it's a usable, user-friendly uh, database. So user graphic interface. So you can do this sort really easy. Look at the Wall Street Journal Medicare database. Wow. Pop in a name of somebody who suspects, see where they fall. See if they're more skewed towards certain procedures versus others compared to others in the area. Just play around with that. I've got a, I've found a database. And the problem with Medicare is that it's two years old and it doesn't cover public, uh, public uh, private claims, insurance claims. Right. There is a database that I found that covers every single freaking claim made by any doctor for reimbursement in the country current as of two months. Wow. So now I'm looking for the data scientists to help me put together a program, data science program, to give me 90, 95 degree a percent uh, certainty that this guy who's number one, who's a standard deviation or two behind number two or three or headed number two or three, that yeah. that guy isn't just a great doctor who people flock to, but he may be in like, you know, the backwoods of Arkansas doing more stents than anybody. It's like, well, that bears some scrutiny, right? Right. Gotcha. Exactly. It's, it's just, this is, this is opioid stuff Yeah. at every level. Yeah. The right. analytical usage too, like getting, all right, now we can grab this data and I can move it in a way that it can give me a much, much better indicator of, oh, wait, that guy in Fort Smith, Arkansas had did, did more surgeries than the dude in LA by like five times and no one's ever heard of this guy. It's, it's interesting. Very interesting. So we're going, there's a, there's a, for example, there's a, a, a back surgeon we're sort of investigating right now and he's way up there in terms of the numbers. And so the joke in the office was, you know, have you had sinus surgery in Northwest Indiana? It may have been necessary. Now the ad is, have you had surgery on North Broadway? It may have been unnecessary. <laughs> have you uh, had it? The, uh, here's a picture of the, the surgery center. Right. You've been here. This might be a problem. Oh, man. That is, well, all right. So those cases were, are unbelievable. Like, we could probably spend a long time talking about those, but I know – uh, Mike and I wanted to talk with you about kind of how we all met, which was, was, was at Rick Friedman's ethos. And uh, the one thing that I, I, and you and I then went on and we've done things with sorry, De Lamont and kind of done her hostage to hero type stuff. And, uh, there's been a big commitment by you to, um, even after 30 something years in the practice to keep finding the next level and to keep putting, you know, you go to these seminars and there's, there's younger guys like me and Mike who are like, oh, yeah, let's try this out. But, you know, you've done these enormous cases, very interesting. You're going 30-something years. Um, your partner's kids are coming into the firm now. What is it that you – when did you decide? What did you decide that, hey, I, I got to go do this stuff. I got to stay on it um, rather than just pack it in? Because it's possible. And it, it's, it makes economic sense. Um, and it, it's, it's so – I mean, I, I grew up – in Munster, Indiana. I mean, Munster is, I'm in, I'm in the same county as Munster. And uh, I'd, I'd like to think there's an altruistic motive for doing this. And I've got a lot of friends who are doctors. And they, and by the way, they're not afraid to tell me. The hospitals never do it, but I get, I get, there's some other people we're investigating right now. But what really got me jazzed up was a Medicare database. And now that I've got access to something else, I can take it to the next level and automate it in a way and, and really make it much easier to identify as opposed to stumbling on something, as, as Mike said. It's hard to walk away from that. Uh, it's hard not to do that. And it's sort of like achieving an economy of scale in our jurisdiction, right? That fee ratio we talked about, 
it's hard to do. I mean, we're so selective and, you know, you, you, the practice becomes peak and troughs. If all you're doing is waiting for these cases to get out of the panel, they do sort of aggregate, sort of harmonize and synchronize in terms of when they all come in. So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, but it's fun. I like trying cases, but now if you can take it to the next level, help everybody in the process and it's economically feasible and you get to try cases too. You get to try more cases. And it's just too interesting well, to, so not, to not dive in. What is it about the Rick Friedman stuff, the Sorry De La Mott stuff that you thought, all right, hey, uh, let, let's do this. Let's go whole. Because when you go to these things, you got to go whole hog. You can't really just dabble in it because that inauthenticity will come through. People are like, yeah, he's not really into it. What is it where you're like, hey, we're, we're going to do this and we're bring our office? So um, probably like you guys um, – you know who the you know who the the wise elders are. I don't mean elders by age. I mean those sure those guys who stand out because not because they've got the big egos, but because they have something really important to say. And you know, I remember the old days. You know, going to the AJ seminars. It was all about everybody talking about how big their verdicts were, right? And uh, just all self promotion. And I just don't get a sense that guys like Rick Friedman, uh, and, you know, um, Mendel, you know, the framing. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some real, I call them gentle giants. Those Keith Mitnick, you know, that could keep going on and on about. These people genuinely seem like they're devoting their time and effort to, to better the profession, to make to make it more ethical in many ways, but also just to truly help. I mean, I love that nobody talks about the numbers, right? To me, that's always been like a turnoff. Anybody can get a you know big eight figure verdict if a truck a drunk truck driver stops in the middle of the road and you know god forbid kills a family of four people right but I, I just i just love the motivation i'm drawn to that and, and friedman is a good example of somebody who's doing it for all the right reasons by all appearances uh he's he's the, he's the antithesis of the ego egotistical trial lawyer and i have a, that's got a lot of appeal to me sure and you know i learned you know we've all been through that phase where we think we're better than the other guy but you know what as you get older all you want to do is learn you can't do this without having a strong curiosity to learn and improve. And you improve, and the, the ethos thing is a good example of proving not only as a lawyer, but also as a person. Right. Yeah. And I, I was so raw. I came home from that. I was like, get ulterior. I just talking to my kids about what they did in school or something. Like, yeah. I was a mess for like two weeks. You guys probably yeah. do. Yeah. yeah. I'm still, I'm still a mess, Mary. I'm still a mess. <laughs> did, you see, did you see the time you spent at ethos and all that stuff? Do you see that reflect in that your actual practice? Those changes that, that personal changes, those personal growth uh, experiences reflect in, in how you guys are running the practice and how you're approaching cases. I think that's exactly right. And I'm sure you guys are the same way. You know, you, you take, we have an advantage over defense attorneys. We can, we can take, we don't have to take every case. We don't, we don't have to get stuck with a client we don't like, or who just, you know, isn't it for the money, right? Lady comes and asks how much a dead baby is worth at their first appointment. We've all been there. Yeah. Um, so that that's helpful to be able to choose your clients and you, you're around, you're at work. This is your workplace. So you want to be around people that you, not only want to be around, but also to protect and take to the courtroom and present to the courtroom. Um, and so that's the philosophy I have in practice. I'm, I don't like, I'm not a bully. I'm not the guy to win at all costs. I want to be able to have a beer with the defense attorneys. And the benefit of doing med mal is I see the same people all the time. I think Holly and I are friendlier with the defense attorneys than we are with the plaintiff's attorneys. We don't see the plaintiff's attorneys much. They're good guys and girls, but women, I should say, but I like them. I like them as people. I'm going to band with the med mal defense attorney. Um, so yes, the practice reflects who you are. And, uh, you don't want a workplace where it's all about conflict and war and, you know, war analogies and, and battle and, you know, screw in the next person because you can without any benefit to your case. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of a kinder, gentler practice of law. You're not any less effective. Yeah. yeah and so it's no less effective. So then what would you tell younger people, um, maybe under 40, maybe myself, uh, who, you know, who, who can attend and sometimes find their way into a, a contentious situation with defense lawyers they thought they could trust or whatever like that. I mean, how do you approach what appears to be a frivolous motion or uh, an unnecessary hearing or something like that? What's the strategy you go through instead of saying, hey, you're an idiot. Let me, you know, what's your process? 
Well, first decide whether something is worth going to mat on. I know mm -hmm. that sounds simplistic, but it's true. I mean, there's, and remember, you get, what, you get what you give, right? So in our case, why would I object to somebody making their submission to the panel when they would object to me asking for it and you know you're going to need it at some point? Yeah. So strategically, it doesn't make sense to piss somebody off, especially in a smaller community. Second, um, judges don't like it. I can tell you that the judges have morphed into, not that they were uncivilized, but they don't tolerate this stuff. You don't like to see brawls in the courtroom. They, get, they physically get uncomfortable with it. You watch a judge when somebody's arguing unnecessarily or even, you know, with a point and they're being a bully or they're, they're used at hominem attacks or they're just embarrassing themselves. Everybody's uncomfortable, the judge no less. And so I think it helps you in the courtroom. I definitely think it helps you with a jury. So if you pick your battle, that's great, but you don't need to be ad hominem about it. You can be, in fact, the skill is, it's much easier to say screw you or some other word than it is to try to use some persuasive technique to get to advance your case, right? Mm -hmm. Learn about rhetoric, learn about um, the persuasion skills and mirroring, all those things that work much better than coming out in somebody's face. I mean, go to a deposition and make a point of being enamored of the expert, you know, yeah. sit in his shoes and lean in on his answers. Mm -hmm. You know, pretend he's a nice guy. He probably is a nice guy, by the way. Yeah. I think there's very few people worthy of the kind of assault that you're talking about, verbal right. assault that you're talking about. And in the end, it doesn't help your client anyway. And if you're happy at home, if you're happy at work, it's not going to happen anyway. If you got that problem, not you, but yeah. if a lawyer has a problem not controlling the temper, there are issues well beyond the workplace. That's right. Well, and that's like my, uh, my, my boys are growing up and they're playing soccer and all that stuff. And my uncle told me, he said, you know, watch the parents who are losing their mind at the game. Something's going on at home. Like that's not a normal reaction. And it's kind of the same in the courtroom, I guess you're saying, or a deposition is you can't confine that just to one area. If someone's really struggling, they're going to be lashing out and it's, it's all over the place. Ask yourself, why is this person like this? And it's usually the same people over and over again. And pretty soon it's like, God, this guy's got some issues. Thank God it's not my issue, you know? And, uh, and right. you want to juxtapose your, you want to juxtapose yourself against that conduct anyway. You want the jurors to have a, see a sharp contrast between that kind of bullshit and your calm demeanor, your calm, skilled, uh, uh, persuasive demeanor. It's funny because, uh, you know, Rick in On Becoming a Trial Lawyer talks about watch how people treat waiters or uh, grocery store clerks or people they just encounter, you get to know a little bit about who they are outside of that environment. And I think that's true. It hits on everything we talked about. And then another thing he said too was, you know, go to therapy. And I remember my first therapy session, the therapist was like, you know, why, why are you here? And I, I was like, Rick Friedman told me to come, you know, and off to the races I've been going and, and it has, it's, I, I feel like if we don't change what's going on in, in our own lives, we can't really be effective as an advocate. Yeah, you know, it goes back to the cortisol level, right? I mean, it's, it's yeah. about what can you do to keep your cortisol level down? That's, a, that's, right. that's one of the pillars of health, right? Keeping your stress level down. That's right. And uh, you know when it goes up. And uh, there, I think there are ways. I mean, I'm, I'm like crazy ADD. I'm, I can't stay focused very long unless I'm in trial, which is why I like trial, right? <laughs> sure. Project oriented. But um, you know when you're there, you can feel it. You know, maybe there's a blood rise in your, or your face or you've got that little thump in your heart. It's like, oh, yeah. it, should, it shouldn't, be, shouldn't have to do it. Or if you do it, it should be a positive stimulation right, try. to get you focused. But uh, I don't know. The old, the, old, the old days of the hard drinking, you know, 14-hour yeah. day trial or don't fly anymore. It's I was going to say there's one way healthy. to – adjust your cortisol level is probably go home and drink a half a bottle or a bottle of bourbon and you'll feel, you'll feel right. <laughs> or maybe just a finger or two, you know, yeah, that's, right. that's right. That's right. That's yeah. right. But that is not, that's not really the way anymore because like you said, it, it, uh, I think what, what people are seeing and trying to do is exactly what you're trying to do is there is, you're, it's a lifestyle now. It's like, Hey, this is, I want to live and I want to live a certain way. I want to be a certain lawyer. I want to be a certain person and I want it to be authentic. Cause if not, I get in front of a jury, the 12 people or whatever it is are going to sniff it out and it's not going to be, it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be. No, it's, sorry, I'll say, how's your breathing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I found that my benefit, one of my benefits, my strong um, uh, 
strengths right now is I've got a lot of friends who have, for the last 25 years who are super fit. We just, we would cycle, we do cycle the triathlons, marathons. And that's great because you get, you get the boy time and you're, and you're having a great time and you're burning calories and you sleep hard and you go to the office and you feel good. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's who you surround yourself with too. Nobody yeah. wants to be surrounded by people they don't like. That's you're right. not going to hire somebody you don't like. That's right. You're not going to, and that's why I'd like to make friends with the defense attorneys in all honesty. It's I like, that's my workplace. Mm-hmm. I would rather, I'm, time. First, I'm, I'm more scared. I, I'm worried about the defense attorney who is nice and friendly anyway, right? Because those are the ones that get you, not yeah. the assholes. Yes. Those ones have better jury appeal anyways. Is like, yes. Uh, yeah. I was in a depot with one today and I was texting with his wife, who is a colleague of mine. And I was like, this is why your husband scares the living shit out of me. He is nice He's not confrontational, and he's just easy to get along with. And it's not a uh, it's not a show. I mean, it's it's genuinely who he is. And that, and I think that speaks a lot to the scariest plaintiffs' lawyers. Maybe are the same thing. Yeah. Exactly. I think they think I think they know that, and it's frustrating. Yeah. yeah. But they but also think about that. They don't like they don't always like their clients. Right. You got to go try this case, and it's a bad case. There's no sure. liability. You have no yeah. your expert sucks, and your client's gonna. Screw up on the stand. Have fun. Have fun. Enjoy. And right. we're going to discount your hours at the end of the day. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. so, you didn't need all that trial prep. Yeah. Right. So, then you got to negotiate like the good 40% of your hours. So yeah. Barry, if, if someone's listening to this and they're thumbing around and they all of a sudden see a rogue doctor analysis or something they have questions about, how can they reach out to you? Oh, trinjurylaw.com. trinjurylaw.com. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We will put that in the show notes. We'll include the articles to the Vanity Fair article and the New York Times article as well in the show notes. We encourage everyone to read those. A fascinating. Yeah, cool. I, I think it's a way of giving back. I mean, we always, we always talk, you know, we always want to be known. Uh, well, we always want to do what's right and help our community, right? It's our family and then our, what's next? Our community. And it's usually like a discreet, like I said, a zip code or something where things are going on. And you make a difference and save lives. Not, we don't have that. We always react to what happened. Rarely can we be proactive and stop bad stuff from happening. And this is a golden opportunity to do that. And uh, it's, it really does, it does represent a way we can give back. Yeah. That's and right. I, I don't, I'm not trying to sound trite or overly altruistic, but I've, I've seen the results. And, you know, we should always be on the lookout for bad doctors hurting people. And it's, you know, if it, you don't need to have 300 lawsuits to do it. You know, a simple the licensing complaint by your client may do it or sure. a simple press release. Even if you don't want the cases, just this only way to do it is, is shine the light where it doesn't shine usually in the hospital setting. And you'll, you'll definitely make a difference. A safer community is, is good for everybody. Obviously. Awesome. Thank you for joining us today, Barry. Really great. appreciate it, man. Appreciate the opportunity. Good to see you guys again. Yeah. As well, brother. Great to see you again. Hope to see you soon. You're listening to the case autopsy, the verdict and settlement podcast. Here's your hosts, Mike Campbell and Chris Finney. I mean, you know, again, you have one big nationally publicized case, and I feel like that's good for a career. This guy's had two. He's probably going to have more. I mean, these are this is wild. And what he was just talking about, he's going to have more because he's doing the work to, <laughs> right. to, to find more. He said they're all over. And, like, I, I mean, if his command of what, of his expertise of his practice area is second to none. I mean, Barry really knows that medicine. He, we know when he was talking about the sinus surgery, it's like he could do the surgery himself. He's talking That's about, right. oh, he, I mean, everybody can hear it. I had to stop him a few times. Like, what, do you, what is that? What is that? Right. What is that? And it's just second nature to him. It's really a pleasure to talk to a guy who knows all that stuff like the back of his hand. And it is a great, it is a great point that, if you're going to get involved in this type of work, yeah. you better be willing to learn the medicine. You better be willing to, to know exactly how those surgeries work inside now. Yeah. And cause if you can't, if you can't explain it, you can't grasp it. You can't, you can't know right. what you're doing. And then you can't identify it. Like he That's said, exactly they're right. identifying these things. I mean, talking $66 million on that New York times case. That is like unbelievable. And it 10 is. years on the, uh, on the ENT stuff. These right. stories, the guy leaving for leaving his wife in Greece in the middle of the night and going to Paris, like this crazy. is crazy. This movie, bananas. 
It's yeah. a, it is. We're going to, I mean, he did American say that greed was American in, uh, greed. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. unbelievable. And I'll, I'll say one thing is, uh, you know, if you've got experts on the other side of your case, defense experts, doctors or whatever, take advantage of that Medicare database. Mm -hmm. right? I was just thinking about that. You could yeah. look these guys up and be like, Hey, you're billing, you're in. And, and so one, I think if you're going to, if you're going to look at medical records and you think something's a little fishy, go to this database, reach out to someone like Barry, talk to him about whether or mm -hmm. not there's something to investigate further, but also take advantage of what's publicly available to look up defense doctors on the other side. And like you said, reach out to Barry. You and I both know him personally. Um, yeah. He is, a tops. I mean, unbelievable. It really is. Really is a good guy. He's. I've had a lot of meetings with him when we were doing this thing with Sorry De Lamotte, and his his advice, his commitment, his authenticity, his integrity. It's it's second to none. And I uh, we're we were lucky to have him as a guest um, to come in and talk about some of these cases, and also made some really good points about personal development and yeah. how you want to handle your practice and be seen and treat others. It's always good reminders for yep. me so well, i uh i'm looking forward to the next one man what a yeah. great episode it was awesome i'll be talking to you buddy See you. that concludes another episode of case autopsy the verdict and settlement podcast part of the lawyer minds ecosystem thank you for listening and we truly hope it was worth your time please consider subscribing to the show wherever you listen to podcasts explore the other content that lawyer minds has to offer and engage with us on social media your feedback and ideas are always welcomed see you next time